currencies. We've got a lot to discuss here with the currencies of Lost Ark. We have to go through silver, gold, crystals, royal crystals, still my own bloodstones, pirate coins, coins of courage, special sea tokens, which include Gianna's coins, Septum's coins, Arcturus's coins, ancient coins, sun coins, and we got to go through Una's task badges, housing seals, three of them, yam cookies, beyonds, rift shards, content currencies, such as the shards, providence stones, raid mats, which I know that's weird. It sounds like a mat, but not a currency, but it's also a currency. Chaos dungeon shards and island tokens. Yes, it's a lot of currencies. Uh, it might be difficult, but most of them will make sense once you see them for the first time and uh, you'll get the hang of it. Don't worry, we'll get through this. Let's start with these. We'll start with the first ones and work our way down. From the top left, there's this little icon right here that looks like a treasure chest. Whenever you click on it, it'll open up your your this is this is essentially your your character's version of a wallet. It holds most of your currencies in it, uh, and so you can track what you got from here. But you could also hide this top bar. There's a little arrow on the top left, and that could hide it if you want a little bit more simplicity to your UI. Currencies that are character bound and currencies that are not character bound. All of these are account wide. This is account wide. These are for characters per character. Uh, this is account wide as well, the Chaos Rift Shards, which we'll go over in a second. Um, these are all... No, no. Uh, the Coins of Courage is account wide. Providence Hearts as well. Oh, this is not relevant to you. This is also account wide. The Silmail Bloodstones, they are not account wide. Each character accrues their own. Special C tokens are also um, account wide. Anything in these tabs in general are all account wide. So profession related stuff, island related stuff, and affinity related stuff, it's all account wide. First off is silver. And for the most part, silvers are gonna come from monster drops, quests, Unis tasks, cube dungeon events, uh, and more. Um, this is the stuff that you use to deal with NPCs. So things like buying potions, chaos shards, and it's also used when you're honing your equipment. Um, another really important use of the silver is uh, as i mentioned before it's worked with npcs and so there are there are a lot of merchants in lost ark which sell an ingredient item and the ingredient item is used to complete a lot of foods in the game uh, for example by this you'll need one million silver and shushire is one of the first continents that you'll encounter and a million silver that's kind of a lot early on so it'll seem like a daunting amount of silver don't worry over time you'll eventually be building up a good amount of silver and a million won't seem like too much um ultimately though the best method of getting a lot of silver is actually um it's playing alternate characters the reason why is because there's a lot of activities that alts can do that generate silver and silver is account-wide currency so all silver you earn on all your characters is shared across all your characters at once and that's similar with many of the different currencies in the game uh, because it's also used for honing as kind of a, a payment when you're honing gear um, it is possible to run out of silver and so you'll see here that every time that i want to make a pass or an attempt at upgrading my item for an example this costs me thirty-eight thousand five hundred silver so it's used on every single attempt and uh that expense could add up over time Additional to that is whenever you're honing an item, before you can actually make attempts to hone the item, you have to fill the EXP on it. And not only do you need the fragments, which we'll go over later, but when you're using the fragments to fill the item, it also costs a lot of silver as well. It won't cost this much, so don't freak out. Uh, this is like end end gear at the highest upgrade level. It gets pretty intense. Uh, it'll be way less when you do it. In fact, through the item codex, you can check for yourself you can see that the amount of fragments that you need is quite small and this will correlate as well in these items so this is actually a 302 item so this is what you can expect uh, a little bit it's not it's not quite accurate because i have a discount on it but you know this is only going to cost me 720 silver to fill the item so you can see there's a very stark contrast from the early game to the late game um ideally you don't <laughs> You don't run out of silver because uh, silver is a finite resource as well. Even though you don't use it to deal with other players, you still want to have a good supply and a good windfall of it. Um, there's a lot of ways that players can accidentally use up a lot of their silver. We went over it earlier in the stream, but 
uh, even the process of rerolling gems could be a very costly endeavor. Again, the most extreme example being level 10 gems. You can see that it cost me 340 silver for each pass. I would only need to roll this three times and it would already cost me a million silver in the hole. So um, early on, obviously, it's not that bad. Level 1 gems, for example, only cost 7,000 per roll. Uh, but rolling gems in general, you should refrain from in the first place. Secondly, gold. Uh, gold is the currency that I think everyone cares about the most because this is the player to player currency. Uh, in any other game, this is like Final Fantasy's Gil or World of Warcraft's gold. Um, and so this is the one that generally you'll care about more. Uh, and this is the main currency that you're using when you're using the auction house. So all dealings in the auction house deal with gold and also peons as well, which we'll go over in a little bit. Okay, so as far as obtaining gold goes, this is all listed in my guide, um, but some of the methods that you'll be using to gain gold, the first one is your Unus task. This is probably the most straightforward. You don't have to read moon runes, okay? Just look at these pretty images and go off of my English explanation, and I'm sure, you know, you'll get it. I believe in you, okay? So as you're completing your Unus tasks and your weekly tasks, you're going to fill up this bar. Every daily task that you complete, will increase this bar by three points and every weekly that you complete will fill it by 12 points and your goal is to reach 25 35 45 55 and 70 points this is shared across all of your characters as well so uh, if you do dailies and weeklies on other characters it will contribute towards this and when you reach each of these thresholds you'll get unus tokens and these unus tokens uh they're pretty important because what you can do is you can bring him to this merchant over here. He's called the Gold Merchant. And with these, you can purchase these caskets with these Unus tokens. And these caskets have a guaranteed amount of gold, but they also have an RNG amount of gold that you can get from them. For example, with this chest, which costs 500 Unus tokens, you'll get around 1,300 gold guaranteed. But there's this small chance that you drop a gold bullion that could be worth 10,000 extra gold on top. Okay. So this amount of Unus tokens that you get is determined by your highest historically achieved item level on your highest character. The higher your item level is, the more Unus tokens you'll get. And the reason behind that is because the higher level you go, the more gold you'll probably need to upgrade in the first place. The amount of Unus tokens that you can earn is tabulated at the beginning of the weekly reset. So if you reach a new threshold where this number should go up, it won't count until the beginning of the next week, and then you'll get the increased amount of Unus tokens. Uh, so it jumps at very specific points, with the highest point being at 1490, where you end up with the amount that I have currently. I think in North America and Europe, on the first week, the most amount of Unus tokens that you can get is about 100. I think about 100, uh, which is enough to get one bag. And why is it so small? Because the thing is, you're not going to run out of gold in either Tier 1 and Tier 2, because the amount of gold costs in tier 1 and tier 2 upgrading is like tiny. It's almost non-existent. You're, you're actually going to run out of materials before you run out of gold in tier 1 and tier 2. So don't worry too much about the whole gold issue because it's really actually not going to affect you that much. Uh, what you'll need is materials, which hey, you can use that gold that you have to get excess materials to progress a little bit faster if you want. That's what you do with your own gold. All right, other sources of gold. Uh, Chaos Dungeons, whenever you clear the second room, which has a boss in it, when you defeat the boss, there's a chance uh, that a either gold or red portal will appear. If it is a gold portal, you'll beat up a little treasure mob inside of it, and it'll drop you materials as well as a small amount of gold. And if you get a red portal, the red portal has a boss inside it, which drops a lot of items and even more gold than the, than the golden color portal, which seems counterintuitive, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, what's very important to know is for those of you guys who are do, planning on doing infinite chaos, if you happen to get a gold or a red portal while you're doing your infinite chaos, uh, it does not give you gold. So it means that while you're doing your chaos dungeons each day on each of your characters, there's a small chance that you just happen to get a portal, which gives you a little bit of an extra boost in gold. It's not a lot, but any, every little bit is nice, right? Right. Uh, additional to that, uh, there's a bunch of one-time sources of gold as well. And they include your initial guide quests, which unlock features. So you can only do them once per roster. And they'll usually give around 50 to 100 gold tops. It's one time, but early on, that's a pretty decent boost in your gold. Uh, report as well. 
there are a bunch of different NPCs uh, in the game that when you raise their report up to a certain level, they'll give you a one-time reward, which is usually a gold coin or a bunch of gold coins. Some of them are really easy to do, such as this NPC. She only takes around 3,000 report, which can be done in like a day or two at most. And uh, it's, it's just an easy little bit of gold, which early on with an early economy is a pretty decent amount. Uh, some of the other NPCs, they might award more gold, but they might be more difficult to do. For example, Sasha, she gives uh, a, a pretty large amount of gold overall. She gives around 3,500 gold total, but her later stages take a very, very long time to complete. Uh, so it's recommended that, that you deal mainly with the NPCs that only require around 2,000 report at first. And then um, that will give you a nice boost at the start. Uh, lastly is the masterpieces. The masterpieces are a collectible. They're earned through a really wide variety of means. You can find out how to unlock them through some of the resource sites such as Maxwell and Papanika. And what you can do with these is you can turn them in at uh, Sunflower Island. And Sunflower Island, uh, once you've collected a good amount, they'll give you a casket with just a ton of gold in them. So these caskets give a good amount. So you can see this one gives 3,000, this one gives 5,000, and this one gives 8,000. And uh, all the way up here, you can uh, get all the way up to 20,000 by the end of it. So one time gold source, but it's a good little boost. It's to reward you for getting your collectibles. Also is the cooperative sea voyage missions. I've talked about cooperative sea voyage missions quite a bit, how important they are to do for to get pirate coins early on for people who want to get the pirate coins and turn them in for card decks and uh, other collectibles that are needed for your C tokens. Uh, that is another currency that we'll go over later on in this. When you go into a cooperative C voyage mission, you'll get these keys and these keys can be used at special C events called gateways. These are separate from the cooperative C voyage missions. When you go into a gateway um, for a respective type of key, you're allowed to use as many keys as you own on hand to open a chest and get rewards and uh, you'll get um, C related rewards but there's also a chance that you get a gateway map and the gateway map when you complete it it's a solo thing just for yourself will give you a pretty decent chunk of gold as well uh, late game tier 3 gateway maps for example can give you over 1000 gold so it's not a small amount uh, but the chances of getting a gateway map uh, is fairly small Adventure Islands are something that appear every single day. Uh, the reward that they give is different for each island, and an island might give a different reward each time you go to it. And they're just meant to be, you know, special event islands that you should definitely go to that gather people all in one place. Sometimes they give gold, and the amount of gold they give, much like anything else, scales based off of your current item level. Uh, if you see an Adventure Island gives gold for the day, it's good to attend it. Please remember that on the weekends. You're allowed to go to two adventure islands and so if you log in late you might miss the first window of, of adventure islands and if it has gold in it it's unfortunate you kind of miss out on it uh, again it's a small amount but it adds up over time and while you're doing adventure islands there's other perks as well such as getting the island heart in some cases like blue hole island you can get a rune for doing it so it's worth doing adventure islands regardless but it's even nicer when you get gold out of it too um when it comes to when it comes in general to Lost Ark, something you have to understand about Lost Ark is you almost never drop gear that is relevant to you. But you will very frequently drop gear that is relevant to someone else. Uh, and so you have to get in this habit of learning how to merch stuff. You kind of have to learn what engravings and what kind of items are worth something to someone else and which ones aren't worth much. Unfortunately, early on, I think people will have a hard time deriving value of what an item truly is worth. So you can potentially snipe up really good deals on the auction house, or you can sell something for higher than what it should. That just makes it sound like I'm trying to tell you to scam people, but you know, it's a doggy dog world out there. Do what you can to make gold. And so please try and get in the habit of trying to figure out what accessories are good and which ones are not because you don't want to dismantle something for scraps when you can potentially sell it for hundreds, if not thousands of gold. Uh, merching is a very, very, very important part of Lost Ark. And it's not just equipment, even merching things like profession related materials, as well as uh, adventure book related mat materials can net you some gold as well. Uh, GVG can give gold as well. And the ranks one through five teams in GVG 
are awarded a lump sum of gold. How do you know what to sell and what to dismantle? It comes with experience. I kind of have a section in my guide where you can check that out. Uh, determining the value of items. You can try and read that. Do you use food a lot? No. Okay. So GVG is another way to get gold. Uh, you can see when we're looking at the different guilds, uh, the GVG spots, certain GVG areas will give a lump sum of gold to its rank 1 through 5 players. So you can see, for example, Medea, uh, first place, the, gold, the guild gets 100,000 gold, fifth place gets 30,000 gold, and then, um, you know, up to rank 10, they'll still get stuff, but they won't get gold. Uh, the higher rank islands, starting from, I think, B award gold? Yeah. So B, A, and S rank territories all award gold for their 1 through 5 positions. This gold is given as a lump sum to the guild leader, and the guild leader has to be responsible enough to divide the gold fairly based on how they run their guild. Does this mean that they can run off the, with the gold? Yes, yes, they can. But I mean, you shouldn't you shouldn't join a guild like that in the first place. Um, different guilds will have their own methods of dividing the gold. So your mileage may vary. So participating in GVG is quite good. Uh, even if you, if you get anywhere in the top five positions, you can get a nice chunk of gold out of it. Uh, Abyssal Dungeons. So in the beta, you might have done Abyssal Dungeons. In Abyssal Dungeons, there was an entry limit of three times per dungeon per character. Um, nowadays, it is a little bit different. They actually reverted it back to one run per week per character per dungeon, meaning on each character, you can run each dungeon once per week. What changed since the beta? Well, the beta, you didn't earn gold. That's a very important distinction to make in the first place. In the beta, all you earned was materials and accessories. But now you earn gold as well, as long as you're within range of the dungeon. So for example, entry level for this is 340 and they will allow you to get gold from this dungeon up until you reach 840. You cannot unequip items to fall back within range. The game records your historic highest level achieve and that determines whether or not you're eligible for gold. Every abyssal dungeon can give some gold now and there is also a limitation in place that prevents you from creating too many alts to get gold this way. So just remember what you had before, which was no guild from Abyssal Dungeons. Now in this new system, you do get gold up to six characters with Earth Gold. And those six characters, they are registered for the week once they've earned gold from any dungeon, and they're allowed to run as many dungeons as they want and that they're eligible for to earn that gold. So let's say, for example, I have a character that is item level 600. Uh, if I send that character into this dungeon, they'll get some gold. If I send it into this dungeon, they'll get some gold. And then this dungeon, they'll get some gold. And then this dungeon, they'll get some gold as well. And that'll only count as one character. That six character per region or server? Server. So if you're in multiple servers, you can technically get more and more gold this way. The character is logged as one of the characters that has earned gold for the week. And at the start of the next weekly reset, this counter goes back to zero and uh, then you can register your next six characters. You still get materials, even if you do not get gold. It is still worth it to many players who have out-leveled this content to run the content anyways, because there's always that small chance that you get a legendary card, and legendary cards are relevant forever. Um, it, you, might, you might get really lucky and go back when you're item level 1400, clear this dungeon, and maybe if you're super lucky, you'll get one of the cards for this set to make progress towards it. Uh, additionally, what's also very important is that in the beta, all you got were materials and accessories, but they have added additional loot to these dungeons for completion. You earn weapon stones, armor stones, and fragments and leap stones as well. All of those ma materials are also given to you when you clear each of these dungeons to help you progress your characters that were not there before. Also, at the end of the dungeon run, you can also get additional loot by using gold. It is not cash shop crystals anymore. They have removed that and replaced it with a flat and lower gold cost. So now uh, you can very easily get the chest at the end uninhibited. Are they bound? Yes, they're bound. Is it worth using the gold though? If it's on prog, yeah, it is worth it. If you're on prog and you're currently progressing through that territory or that that level bracket, it's worth it. Um, and the, the amount of gold that it costs to get the chest will always be lower than the amount of gold you earn from the instance itself. 
but you can buy blue crystals with gold so it's basically the same well first of all the price is actually lower than what it was before if you did that conversion and second of all it's all about optics okay if you're at the end of a dungeon and it costs you cash shop currency in order to open the chest that just looks pay to win if it costs you in-game gold though you don't think the same way optics it's everything do you get scaled down in these or do you just power through everything with the item level nope you don't get scaled down in it and who the hell cares because if you're doing these dungeons you're supposed to be doing the dungeons that are relevant to your item level in the first place and that's why the gold penalty is put in place uh also at the end of a abyssal dungeon after you have successfully completed it as well as the end of abyssal raids there is additional loot in an auction system you get your own personal loot but there is extra additional auction loot the person who bids the most gold gets the auctioned item and the amount that they bid is split evenly among all other raid participants in a GDKP system. You don't even have to stay for the bid. If you don't want it, you can just leave and whatever they bid on it, you'll just get it in the mail. Sometimes um, when I run this dungeon, right? I run it with randoms and sometimes a legendary selection card pack appears in the auction loot at the end and legendary selection card packs are extremely valuable because they let you pick whichever legendary card you want. Uh, so people put a high value on it. So whenever those appear, people go crazy bidding on them. They'll, they'll bid like 20, 30,000 uh, gold and then that gets split amongst everyone else so i'll leave this content with like a cool like seven eight thousand gold from what they bid on it it's such easy gold when that happens um i know that some of you guys might be wondering if you're doing one run instead of three don't you get less materials they increased the amount of materials and accessories and items you get from one run now it's to prevent burnout so you don't have to do three runs over and over the crystals and the royal crystals so when it comes to crystals and royal crystals, this is your cash shop currency that you would purchase with real money. And this is your blue, this is your crystal currency. It serves as an intermediary currency um, between people who use real money and people who are using gold. There is a gold exchange in place. And from here, you can use your real life money to convert for gold and vice versa. This allows you to obtain cash shop currency, which can be useful to pick up stuff in the cash shop as a free to play player using that gold and picking up these crystals. So that's for that, crystals are used for a lot of different things. A lot of in-game functions are expanded by using crystals. You can unlock additional character preset slots. You can unlock additional skill preset slots. Uh, and more. There's there's actually quite a few different preset slots that you can unlock through using your crystals if you want more freedom in setting up integrated presets. Integrated presets allow you to make custom builds and switch it all in one click. Uh, besides for that, blue crystals can be used in Mari Shop, which offers rotating deals on a six hour rotation. Uh, some of these are good, but some of these are really, really bad. It's very, very, very important that you take the time to math out the deals relative to what they are in the cash shop. There's a good chance that rather than buying it from Mari, you can actually get it much cheaper from the players on the auction house, which makes it a waste of your money if you do that. Besides for that, they will occasionally sell packages and packages frequently cost royal crystals rather than normal crystals. Uh, this is oftentimes stuff like new costumes that are being released, which means that you would not be able to use your gold to convert into blue crystals to, to buy these packages. But if it's something like a costume, uh, what you can do is you can actually just go into the auction house itself and whether it's a costume or a mount or a pet, uh, you can actually pick it up from other players and if it's a costume you should double check the auction house before you spend real money to do it because often oftentimes people will sell it for cheaper on the auction house than what you would spend if you spent real money uh in the cash shop so please double check before you make a purchase you might be able to get it cheaper in another way that applies to both mari shop as well as the cash shop in general uh lastly blue crystals can be used to purchase the crystalline aura the west version of lost ark is the only region in the entire world that has the ability to purchase the monthly sub called the crystalline aura using blue crystals uh, or their gold and no other region can do that and the price is actually a lot cheaper as well compared to what other regions have to pay i pay in korea 25 dollars for everything uh, so it's a pretty big difference and being able to get it for in-game currency is a pretty big deal as well 
What do you get in Korea that you don't get in the West? Um, my ship travels like a little bit faster and I get 10% more EXP, I think. I think that's what I get that you don't have. What's very important to know about the exchange as well is that you cannot sell blue crystals. So if you use your gold to buy someone else's blue crystals, you cannot sell them later on down the line. It's a one-way exchange. Uh, also, there's a few one-time sources of rewards of blue crystals. Some of them come from questing and some of them come from your roster level at special milestones. They will give you blue crystals as well. Peons. Peons are something that you have to use in addition to gold when you're purchasing equipment from the auction house. Uh, they're denoted by this little blue coin thing and they come from a few sources. The first source is it, they come from the cash shop. They cost blue crystals. So if you need Peons in a pinch, convert your gold and you can pick them up that way. And then they also sometimes give out Peons for event rewards as well. Uh, this is something that you, you might not have to deal with early on because in Korea currently, items in tier one do not actually cost any Peons to exchange. And in tier two, they only cost one Peon. So uh, I have no idea if they're implementing that or if that's just like an old server thing in Korea. When you are purchasing equipment, you'll have to pay a certain amount of fiance depending on the rarity and the level of the equipment. Uh, the amount will vary depending uh, the higher the tier of the item and the higher the rarity, the more fiance it will cost in addition to its gold cost. Um, since fiance have a static value based on their crystal cost relative to the current exchange rate of gold to blue crystals, that means that a lot of times items could cost way more because of the peons than what their gold cost leads you on to believe. You might be paying one gold for an item, but maybe the peons are worth several hundred gold. Uh, this also applies to costumes as well. Please be very careful when you're purchasing costumes from other players because if the costume has less than three binds left on it, it'll cost peons in addition to gold. It's like the item is used, so you have to pay a use tax. If the item has three binds left on it, there's no Fion cost. Fions do not go to the seller, they go into the void. So I do not personally know what economic benefits Fions have, but to my understanding, the inclusion of Fions prevents a lot of market manipulation related behavior. I will tell you guys a little history lesson though. Uh, about a year ago, we didn't have peons. Instead, we had something called packaging boxes. And you had to package the item up and list it up, and then you were allowed to list it on the auction house. And that came with the risk that you package the item and nobody buys it and you wasted your, your boxes. Nowadays, you could just list items freely and it's on the buyer to provide what is essentially the old packaging box which is about 10,000 times better than what it used to be. How do you earn Fionn's to use? You convert your gold into blue crystals and then you exchange them for them in the cash shop. Why didn't they make the item just stay packaged if it went unsold? It did, but what if no one ever buys it? What if you package, what if you wasted your Fionn's packaging an item and literally no one ever buyed it, bought it? Then you wasted your cash shop currency. At least with Fionn's, you have the selection of picking what you want, you know what I mean? Does the auction house still take a cut from the sales? Yes. If so, how much is it? Uh, good question. There is a listing fee, which is a deposit, and then there's a tax. If you pull your item off the auction house early, you don't get the listing fee back. If it goes unsold, you get the listing fee back. Yeah, I think it's 5%. That 5% also applies to mailing gold to another player and exchanging it directly with them. The only way to avoid tax is to go into an instance with the person you want to give gold to, go to the end of the instance, and then at the auction, you give them gold that way. That's totally an oversight, but that gold is tax-free. Silmail Bloodstones. Silmail Bloodstones are this currency right here. This is your guild currency. You get this for doing basic activities related to the gold, such as researching support, as well as completing guild quests and checking in daily. These bloodstones are a currency that is used in the guild shop and you're able to buy different materials to assist you with your progression depending on the research level of your guild as well. So the more, the higher your research is, the more things you're able to actually purchase from the shop. In addition, in addition of course, items also have 
a item level requirement to buy them. So if you're a brand new player, don't expect to be able to buy tier two and tier three materials until you actually reach the item level yourself. But this little red thing right here means that research level two and research level four are needed uh, before you're able to purchase it. And you can see that there are multiple of the same item with different stocks. And what this pretty much means is that if your guild is not leveled at all, you can buy a little bit of materials with your Silmail Bloodstones. But if you reach guild level two research, then instead of five of the stock, uh, then you can get 15 total. And with level four research, uh, it's not 15, it's 29 of the stock of the material, and every item is like this, so you can get a decent chunk of materials. In addition to the Silmail Bloodstones, you can get EXP potions, which assist your growth while leveling up, up to level 59. Uh, boxes, which give you a little bit of silver, which can help if you're hurting on silver. And boxes, which either give you silver or tickets to certain contents like Boss Rush and Cube Dungeon. Uh, as far as these Bloodstones go, you also get a payout of bloodstones at the beginning of every week if you hit the minimum contribution level set by the guild leader and the amount that you get is based on the guild leader split how much bloodstone goes to his members and how much guild bloodstones goes to the guild to assist with its leveling process uh, the big the big things that give you bloodstones besides for the weekly payout of bloodstones is completing guild quests as well as GVG. Just participation for GVG will get you a pretty reasonable size of bloodstones, um, regardless of win or lose. And regarding guild quests, you can, you, can, you can take one guild quest of each category that is set by the guild leader at the beginning of every week, and you can get a bloodstone payout for each category. You're allowed to repeat the guild quests as many times as you want for contribution, but you'll only get the bloodstone payout once. So you can get contribution and you can help your guild fill out the milestone or it's finishing their guild quest quota for the week. How long do guild quests take? Um, they usually don't take horribly lo long. Uh, they, they can take like anywhere between like 10 and 30 minutes, depending on what you're doing. Some are professions. Some will ask you to go do PVP a bunch. Uh, some will just go tell you to do boss rush or do cube once. And those are fairly quick. The next currency we're going to talk about is the coins of courage. And the coins of courage is a PVP currency. When you're PvPing at the end of every match, regardless if you win or lose, you'll get a bunch of um, coins. It's not a whole lot. The main source of PvP tokens is from your PvP level. Your PvP level is independent of your MMR from ranked, and what your PvP level dictates is what you can purchase from the PvP store, and it is determined by your PvP activity in general. So, how does this work? Well, when you start PvP, you're going to start at rank G20 and work your way up. And eventually, once you go from G9, G20 to G19, 18, 17, 16, all the way down to 1, after you go past that, you will reach the ranked level, which allows you to start participating in ranked PvP. Then, as long as you've done at least one PvP match in the week, then um, as, you, as you do matches, you'll accrue points and you get different amounts of points depending on what PvP activity you did if you hover over this question mark it'll tell you what activity awards how many points doing things like ranked gives more points and participating in the weekly guild event at, at uh, medea and slime island also awards a good chunk of points as well for each activity you do you gain these points and the points are reset at the beginning of every week but you are ranked against all other players only on your server only on your server not the region just your server and the players that did more pvp are put in a lower percentile bracket and earn more points. Every week, as you go up and up and up in PvP level, you, there is decay. And in order to counteract that, you need to play PvP to build up these points. Uh, and when you go into certain percentiles, you get more EXP at the start of the week, which can level up your PvP level. And by leveling up your PvP level, you can get more coins of courage at the beginning of every week. Currently at uh, poll 5, I decay 17,000 points every single week. So in order to counteract this, I need to PvP enough to be in the top 30 to 40% pile of PvPers. And I get about 7,000 coins of courage every week as a stipend. If I keep going up, the amount keeps going up as well. And if you get all the way up to the martial rank, which decays 48,000 points every, uh, or EXP every week, you can get as much as 26,000 coins of courage every week. Those coins of courage are spent at the PvP NPC. And the PvP NPC has a bunch of really cool stuff. It follows the same exact format as the Silmail Bloodstone, where the higher your PvP level, ranked, pull 4, pull 6, pull 8, the more stock of an item you can purchase. And there's a lot of different materials here. It's a good amount of materials that you can get with your Coins of Courage. 
In addition to that, there's the special equipment here for the PvP badge, which is used in open world, such as GBG and Rowan later on, as well as some uh, vanity related items, such as a seasonal mount, as well as titles and auras. The mount and the aura expire, but that's because they are extremely, extremely easy to get, and uh, they last for until the beginning of the next season. So they la they'll last you for many, 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 many months. Uh, before they do expire and then all you have to do is pvp a little bit a little bit on the next season and then you can get the mount again uh, so it is a very very easy to upkeep even after it expires you'll be able to get it again and then you can enjoy your uh, pvp legendary mount this vendor tier one tier two useful stuff you can get you can get extra materials nice to have Tier 3, though, is really wonky. And the problem with Tier 3 mats is they have this weird stipulation where if you buy a material from it, the price will go up. So this is 280 of these. I have 338. After I buy one, the price goes up to 330. I guess it's to prevent people from, like, over farming it. They were very cautious when they implemented this because they were worried that it could result in, like, uh mass crashing of materials but um yeah the thing is you know it's not worth your time um that's that's the problem it is the amount of material the amount of the material you would need to buy 99 would never ever ever be worth your time these it's okay because the price doesn't go up with each purchase but these it's kind of like i think you do other stuff that's more productive than farming chaos dungeon at that point okay Content currencies. This is probably something that'll bottleneck a lot of people on upgrading in general. Um, they're the fragments of life, fragments of harmony, fragments of honor. These are the things that I showed you guys before when I was upgrading that I had to fill up the item and use some of them with every upgrade attempt. It's really easy to run out of these. Uh, they're very important for upgrading in general and uh, they're for each respective tier. You cannot trade them up either. If you have tier one fragments, you cannot, you can, you, you cannot turn fragments of harmony, the green ones, into fragments of life, the blue ones. So uh, you only you should only get what you actually need and then move on. These two eight, this twenty eight eighty nine, it'll never be useful for anything. The fragments themselves are earned from chaos dungeon, direct drops from mo as direct drops from mobs. When you dismantle equipment, you'll get them, um, and when you complete raids, you'll get them as a raw reward as well. In addition to materials and everything else that abyssal dungeons provide. Uh, on top of that, you can get them from Chaos Gate treasure maps, daily and weekly Una tasks, and um, sometimes events as well. They they let you earn a little bit uh, through that. Um, you'll basically just build it up passively over time. But if you're trying to go on a mass upgrade spree, like you just have so much of other materials, it's easy, easy to forget these. The bags that you could open... Um, first of all, if Marie's shop offers this stuff... Usually it is pretty worth it gold wise. I think for me, this is about 40% cheaper than the player market. But the thing about the chaos gates after you get a map and share the map and get the loot is that all the materials you get from a chaos gate treasure map are unbound. So the attribution materials as well as the fragment bags themselves uh, can be listed on the auction house and players usually charge quite a bit for those. Um, so these are the bags that I'm talking about. This is just an event casket, but um, the bags themselves, you'd be able to list them. Pirate coins, pirate coins. Pirate coins are really important. You buy a shit ton of things with pirate coins in general. Uh, it's probably one of the most important bit currencies for you to pick up. Um, you can get them in a couple of ways. The main way of getting them is cooperative sea voyage missions. Uh, the main way I get them is just from events nowadays, but the Adventure Island can also give you quite a bit of pirate coins as well. And lastly, there are reputations as well that can give you a big you know, 10, 20k lump of pirate coins. Uh, you could also gamba pirate coins on Carl Hertz. You could spend 600 um, pirate coins to liberate a female slave or 900 to liberate a male slave. And then for liberating them, they send you a casket, which could usually give you net positive on pirate coins. Like you'll spend 900 and they'll send you back like 3000 as thank you. That's not a quality. The reason it's different is because they have different rewards based on the different costs. So something like a 1000 pirate coin female might not give you pirate coins. Maybe she'll give you something different that is useful.
No, you can't buy slaves in Lost Ark. What you can do is you can liberate them. You go to the auction and you pay the person to liberate them and then they run away and then they send you a casket as thank you for freeing them. Oh yeah, there's a lot of really grim shit in Lost Ark in general. But it's also a relatively important daily to do because also the island heart comes from it. Uh, it is one of the many island hearts to do that regularly until you eventually get a casket that has the island heart in it. Pirate coins though. Pirate coins are primarily spent at these ships outside of every harbor. And with the special sea voyage tokens, you can exchange them for pirate coins. But do note that there's a bunch of stuff that requires specifically the coin itself to purchase. Like there's some collectibles that require Janus coins, for example. But if you have excess coins, you can trade them up. And for example, I can trade 7,600 solar coins and it'll give me 152,000 pirate coins. Pirate coins themselves can be used to purchase materials used to upgrade your boat. Uh, but there's also a tab at the end, which is per character and its materials, and they're unbound materials at that. So if you have multiple characters and you have a lot of pirate coins, you can get a bunch of unbound materials and funnel them all to one character, or you can sell them yourself. The fragment bags, they're not unbound, but the mats themselves are, un they are unbound. Um, there's also some e EXP potions at the end here too. So that's a pretty good way to get some extra materials as well. Uh, besides for that, pirate coins, they... Yeah, they're, they're, they're used for uh, a bunch of things. Um, if you want the fastest boat in the game, which is the Astray, which is this boat, uh, you need 300,000 pirate coins in order to get it. What level should your boat be for T3 Sea Voyage missions? Um, for T3 Sea Voyage missions, uh, it could be pretty tough because the dangerous waters that they'll ask you to go into are level four. And the thing is, if you don't have if you don't have a lot of players on your server with high level boats, you cannot complete the high level cooperative sea voyage missions. You, you, the time will just elapse, expire, and you'll get nothing out of it. So in that case, you should go to a lower level cooperative sea voyage mission where people are partaking and at least get the coins from that. What's the big sword in the water? That's like lore related stuff, unimportant. Eventually, if you want pirate coins, you don't really need to do a whole lot of cooperative sea voyage missions. I stopped doing cooperative sea voyage missions altogether. And uh, now I just do Adventure Islands and some uh, Adventure Island with these coin boxes gives me uh, give or take roughly around 14,000 pirate coins for just doing one Adventure Island that gives this stuff. Um, and then just a, between that and events, it usually gets me more than enough where I don't have to worry about doing cooperative sea voyage missions anymore. Is going for the fastest ship right away a good idea? No. Uh, a big tip that I have is that um, you should just level this ship initially. Uh, starting in the region that you're doing is just just upgrade this ship a bunch of times because you'll get you'll get this you'll get some speed and it's it, it's it's just a good idea the stock is it has very balanced resistances across the board and there's some good ships there's some good sailors for it to raise its resistances the main thing is you just want some speed early on because in the early progression of lost ark you will be sailing around a lot and so every little bit of ship speed that you have will save you time in the long run. So if you have extra stuff to upgrade your ship a couple times, like level three, level four, I mean, that's already going to be better than just the ship being at level one. Uh, the next currency is the Rift Shards. And you'll get these after completing any Chaos Gate. Chaos Gates, after you complete them, you'll get a card pack, you'll get a treasure map, and you'll, al you'll also get some Rift Shards as well. And the Rift Shards are located in this one. It's these three pointy looking things. And what you can do with them is you can bring them to an NPC located over here. And with these boxes, you can get additional treasure maps that you can do. And these are the treasure maps that award unbound fusion materials, as well as uh, unbound bags, fragment bags, uh, which you can share with your friends as well. So it's just an extra way to get extra maps after you already looted maps as well. Um, the Providence Stones, we're nearing the tail end here. The Providence Stones are these things, so they drop from elite monsters, and there's Unus tasks that also provide them as well. Uh, you'll kind of, you'll kind of just build them up naturally, especially from killing elites while you're just doing random activities. Uh, they don't really have a very important use, but I mean, some people might like using them still. Uh, mainly, the Providence Hearts are used to get additional report items, so gifts that you can give to NPCs to raise their report level faster with you. Uh, early on especially, this is quite nice. And so there will be NPCs posted in every city and they'll have, you know, these different report boxes that you can purchase with your uh, Providence Hearts. 
There's also some outfits here, so if you really want uh, a uh, a heroic outfit or a purple tier outfit, this is one place where you can actually get that. Um, the cheaper ones are a little bit cheap. They're they're uh, they're a lower rarity. They're blue, so they don't give as much stat as the purple one. Um, it's not really something you can do short term though, because the amount of providence hearts needed to actually purchase these is quite a lot. Uh, so it, it'll take some time, but eventually you can get these outfits if you just really like the aesthetic of them for any reason. How do report gifts work? Sure. Uh, I can... Oh, wait, no, I can't show you. Uh, yeah, I can't show you. All my NPCs are maxed out, so I can't gift any of them anymore. It's account-wide. If, if something seems like it would be a pain in the ass to do on, on, on multiple characters, you could probably safely assume that it's account-wide. How long did it take for you to max all rapport? Um, it takes a few weeks if you don't use any gift items, but the thing is, now that all my NPCs are maxed out, I slowly just build up a shit ton of rapport items uh, that just sit here collecting dust, so when they introduce new NPCs, I can just max them instantly if I want. So, nowadays, when new NPCs come out, I just max them instantly. When it comes to rapport, there are NPCs that are in the continents, and then there's NPCs that are on the islands island npcs they have their reward and all um which is which is great sure uh but they don't contribute to the adventurer's tome the adventurer's tome if you hover over this little heart icon this bar here it tells you what npcs you actually have to max out to max out the adventurer's tome um so certain npcs contribute towards completing this while certain ones are just there for the sake of being there or they give something like the island heart or something that they're part of Side quests don't contribute to Adventurer's Tome. Only these two do. These two specific quests uh, in a region. Every region has two quests that contribute to the Adventurer's Tome. Literally no other Adventurer's uh, side quest contributes to it. Uh, the idea is that your pets, they run on these treadmills and it earns you something called jam cookies. And the jam cookies can be brought to an NPC here where you can get items that are used to upgrade their rarity from epic to legendary and if it's a blue rarity pet you could upgrade it from blue to epic uh or purple and there's also a bunch of cosmetic items that you can get here as well uh anything from fox ears to a lost arc hoodie it's mostly cosmetic related things uh that's really all these jam cookies are used for what's the difference so when it comes to the pet, uh, a legendary pet has a legendary pet skill. Unfortunately, the le well, it may be fortunately, depending on who you ask, it is the most garbage thing ever. It has completely non-factor. That's how useless it is. The other thing that a legendary pet can do is legendary pets have the ability to expand the pet inventory by one and later by two extra rows. And that's for all characters that get the extra inventory space. So that's a pretty good perk of it as well. More inventory space is always nice. And uh, uh, lastly, probably one of the best parts about legendary pets is that legendary pets have the ability for 5,000 jam cookies to unlock a permanent transmog feature where any pet that you've unlocked in general, you can change the appearance of that legendary pet so that you can have any pet look you want while retaining the stats that's currently on that pet. So really, those are the main two benefits of having a legendary pet is more inventory space and pet transmog. Is it like BDO where you can have five pets following you around? No, just one. The reason that I have two is because for some reason, whenever you visit the pet ranch, um, one of the pets that are just passively hanging out here just follows you randomly. Uh, the reason my pet doesn't have a glow is because it's transmogged right now. The only pet that, that actually does have the glow is the original pet that I upgraded, which is the Chunky Shiba. So he has his little legendary glow. The actual process of getting the legendary pet is uh, the pet needs to train 100,000 EXP. And then after it's trained 100,000 EXP, uh, you could use bottles to assist with this, which you can get for jam cookies. You need 25 of a token, which comes from the jam cookies. Usually you'll get the token from this box and almost always you'll get like one. It's super weighted towards one and the token itself. And uh, you need 25 of them 
and then you can upgrade your pet to legendary. The housing seals. Um, once you use when you once you use the item that like gives you ownership of the pet, you cannot um, sell it anymore. If you have not equipped the pet or learned the pet, you can sell it on the auction house. Um, right. So housing seals. That is the stuff that is right here. The yellow, red, and green seal. They all have different names. These are awarded for sending out your expeditions. Um, that's what this is. Sending these out will award you the seals as they come back. You can't fail the expedition, so you'll always get seals. And the better the success, the more seals you get out of it. Maybe you get some extra stuff out of it. You get some housing XP. You can even get the Providence Hearts that I was talking about before as well, which I, I didn't even realize you get the Providence Hearts. That's probably where I've been getting most of the Providence Hearts from in the first place. For the most part, um, what you get out of these, you can you can buy some any related items. There are some runes you could purchase. And uh, in order to get these merchants in the first place, you had to complete their legendary quest. When you complete the adventurer's tome up to certain points, you'll eventually uh, find these golden scrolls. And by completing the quest, which is a really quick cut quest of just talking to a few NPCs, you unlock a merchant that can visit your estate and start selling these things. You might think to yourself, okay, well, if I don't level up my state and I don't get these things, can I get the things that the merchants are selling at all uh, if you don't care about your house? Yes you you can go visit another person's house that has the merchant and you can buy it from their merchant so um there's a couple of really useful things that you can get from the merchants that visit your island uh, the most notable thing is the legendary condemn and the legendary judgment rune which come from the legendary quest in south Vern's 70 percent completion in order to do it your state needs to be at least level 55 so some of these require you to have a certain level of state before the merchant can visit your land a 55 takes quite a while in order to do the thing is this stock of items is personal for you only you can buy these items but this stock of items um this stock of items is for visitors of your estate when they've come over to your place and then they interact with the merchant uh they can also purchase the important thing that the merchant sells so in this case they sell a blue rarity mana reduction rune so uh, if someone doesn't have this NVC but they want this rune, they can come over, spend 2850 of the screen currency, and then they can get this rune as well. There's only one stock though. Um, but yeah, later on, if there is a specific thing that you want from a merchant, but you don't have that merchant, you can always visit other people's estates and uh, pick them up. Um, from your house, you also have settings that can prevent people from interacting with certain things, such as the merchants. You can prevent either non-guildmates, non-friends, etc. from either entering your state or interacting with certain things like the nodes, the profession nodes. Um, besides for that, one of, the, one of the good ways that you can get wow. currencies as well is sometimes they hold a Hyper Express event, and when you complete the event of leveling up a character up to a certain level, they usually give like 5,000 of all three of the currencies on top of that. So. Uh, you can slowly build up your currencies. I'm building up my currencies, and the reason why is I would imagine that one day they'll add more stuff that you could buy with those. So I want to have a pretty big safety net of them so that whenever they do, I could pick them up immediately. Lastly is the island tokens. In this tab here, you'll see everything related to your islands, and this tab specifically are your island tokens. There's a bunch of islands that have merchants, and then they have tokens that are related to their mini games, such as Peach Island, uh, the Peach Island Piers, there's some minigames related there. You can get the Island Heart for around 5,600 Peaches. Um, each of these have their own use in their respective islands, and when you turn them in, uh, you can claim the reward. Sometimes it's related to progression-related items as well, such as the Island of Grief, which might be present at the beginning of NA and EU. That's actually a very important island if it is, because there's a lot of materials that you can get from the Island of Grief, uh, much more than your average island in general. Is that the Tower Island? No, it's the it's the island with Stella located right down here. And that's it. That is every currency in the game, uh, how to get them and what they do.